nice setting. <laughs> Thank you. You have more space, so you go there. such a global debate, and I would say that maybe Rosa Luxemburg and Berlin are only Rosa Luxemburg. Um, might, might find us, but, uh, we had it 10 years ago, and we met, and this is still up to date, important. we met in Brazil for four entire days to discuss, and our working group on the young development, we meet all this week, two days is public event, one and a half days public, and then three and a half or four days um, in, in, a, in a hostel. Uh, I would just like to ask you, can you make sure that only the mic is, uh, only one mic is on, the one that you speak into, uh, okay. at a time, because otherwise this we have all, I use that one. I yes. am using that one, but probably... I use that at the beginning, and then I switch it off. Okay. Now it's switched. Alberto and I were discussing that we should try and put together something on notions of well, well-being and so on and so forth from across the world. Yeah. So this could be an interesting thing to yeah. put together. Yeah. And to, have, to have really a long meeting, but also with, with a purpose, probably a book or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was in Nyan um, uh, two months ago, and we had a workshop on social ecological transformation. We also extracted this and post extracted this. And it's exactly what happens here. They don't have the, 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 the concepts. But we had Ricardo Lander from Venezuela, Miriam Lang from Quito, and um, they said that it's exactly what happens here. Yeah. That's a class project, a state project, a Chinese project. Yeah. And, uh, and this would be great, but also to share the debate on the alternatives. Yeah. Christoph Dirk is there. Mm -hmm. Behind the camera, you won't see him actually. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm also interested in people from Taiwan and China mm. and so on. So I think it would be fantastic in yeah. the cross culture. So for translation, German, the translation into German, we have German translation is channel one. The translation into English is channel two. And the translation into Spanish is um, channel four. And we have three English contributions, or two English contributions. I'm going to talk in English and one Spanish contribution. So those who do not understand Spanish, please organize a headset. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this panel discussion, degrowth and possible alliances between global north and global south. In recent debates about degrowth, sometimes it happens that people agree here in Germany and other countries with the motivations and objectives of the degrowth proposal. But the south must grow to solve its problems of poverty, of hunger. I usually answer, what is the South? Is it the landowner in Indonesia who just set up a um, palm oil plantage and um, expelled uh, local farmers? Is it large-scale water dams or what is exactly the South? But beside the question, what is the South? We want to deal with the question, this is not our question of the panel, but beside this urgent question is what 
under conditions of globalized capitalism, how can we understand um, alternatives to emancipation from a globalized perspective, which includes, of course, a northern and southern uh, experiences. So there's an attractive, compelling proposal, which is degrowth, which brings us together here, which was and is still developed mainly in Europe and um, referring also to the experiences in southern Europe, which I think is important to, to acknowledge. We want to deal this morning here with two, maybe three questions. The first, what does the degrowth proposal mean for the global south, for countries, for experiences, for struggles in the global south? Does it resonate? Does it give common ground to existing struggles? Does it orient struggles in countries of the global south, in continents, in concrete uh, 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 contestation? The second question we want to um, pose here is, does the degrowth perspective, or maybe other ones, when we do not agree that degrowth is a proposal for, for the whole world, but we start with this question, does the degrowth perspective has the potential to create and intensify alliances between emancipatory actors in the global north and the global south? And, and, when we, when we have a yes to those questions, when we have a yes to those questions, can the degrowth proposal in the global uh, south, but also the struggles in the global south, south and the experiences, can they ori orient, intensify, improve the degrowth perspective in the global north, which is of course also important. So I'm convinced that we will get some answers, but I'm also sure that at one o'clock, we will leave this room with many questions, but I'm sure many important questions. So my name is uh, Uli Brandt. I was invited by the organizers to um, prepare this panel, and um, I'm very happy to facilitate this. I work at Vienna University in the um, area of international politics, international environmental and resource politics, and I, I'm member of the Scientific Council of Attack Germany and of BUKO, the federal coordination of internationalist groups in Germany. Beatriz Rodriguez Larayos comes from Barcelona. She works at the Autonomous University in Barcelona. She is ecolo an ecological economist, and she works in a, I would say, yeah, quite famous and important a project, EJOLT, which tries to figure out, to do research, to analyze, and also to support environmental justice organizations. And she is member of a, a group which is called uh, Research and Degrowth, the group, I would say, a bit the backbone of the four uh, degrowth conferences uh, um, and we had up to date. Ashish Kotari is a um, scholar and activist uh, from India. I know him quite a time because he plays a very, very important role in the international deliberations on biodiversity and the convention on biological diversity. He's active um, in an NGO, uh, one can say, uh, Kalva Priksh. I hope I pronounced it right. Kalpa Priksh. Kalpa Priksh. And uh, yeah, a very important uh, NGO, um, yeah, also uh, doing community-based uh, work. And as I said, um, 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 very important um, scholar, intellectual in the field of international um, environmental politics and also other fields. Alberto Acosta comes from Ecuador. He's already quite known since he gave also an introductory lecture here. He works at Flaxo at the um, Faculty for Social um, Sciences um, in, uh, for Latin America in uh, Quito. And he um, was president of the, the Constituency um, Assembly uh, to create a new constitution for Ecuador, one, I would say, of the most progressive constitutions uh, in, in the world. And he was minister of um, mining in Ecuador before he quit this um, due to yeah, some political reasons um, he might um, explain. Because it's part of the deliberations we have here. What is the degrowth of uh, proposal of water alternatives? So we have a first round of inputs. I ask the presenters to talk um, maximum 12 minutes. Then I might ask one, one or two questions um, in order to um, push a bit uh, the debate and to, to um, intensify uh, the perspectives. And depends a bit on the discipline of the first intervention. And then we have 45 minutes.
to discuss here uh, in common uh, with the audience, and we, will, and we will have maybe one brief round here on the podium to give first responses, and then we have um, a final round. Before uh, Beatrice starts, I ask again um, that helpers who are willing to help to make this conference possible go out um, here in the audience who are still uh, yet not um, inscribed and uh, um, are still um, willing to help. Please go out. Outside is the contact desk, desk to um, help in, in different um, fields here to make this conference um, um, uh, happen and possible. So, I ask Bea for her intervention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for inviting me for, uh, to the panel. What I expect to be my contribution to the discussion is to disclose main concerns and possible analogies as well between the scope of action of environmental justice organizations in the Global South and the postulates of the degrowth debate. Uh, we know as a, back, as a background that environmental justice uh, movements started as a concept, or environmental justice as a concept, started in the United States uh, in the 80s around uh, uh, waste management struggles. But uh, they were capable to develop a vocabulary uh, to fight against um, unequal distributions of environmental harms. This uh, vocabulary has expanded and going also to what we call the Global South, uh, where the vocabulary itself has expanded and um, being applied to different uh, contexts, new terms come now from the oh, coming before from the global south uh, terms like uh, ecological debt, climate debt, are clearly uh, concepts for the environmental justice movements coming from the uh, what we call the global south. This is what what we study in uh, our initial project. EJOL reunites EJOL, uh, what we call EJOL, environmental justice organizations, um, and academics to produce an, a variety of outcomes. Uh, we produce collective reports, as the one you can see here, and many others uh, published online about uh, a variety of topics, tree plantations, mining conflicts, land grabbing, proposals as well, like the one of leaving uh, fossil fuels and underground. Together, we also have developed a large uh, database uh, with cases of environmental justice, conflicts, and resistance that you can uh, check, you can see, and you can contribute to is available online. Uh, my motivation for this talk today is that there, there are clear commonalities between environmental justice and the growth. Uh, from the social metabolism point of view, they both warnness uh, against the increase in the physical dimension of the economy. Uh, they does, uh, have extractivism and debt field economies as common enemies. And importantly, they both started as social movements uh, that have led scholarship in, this, uh, uh, in his, uh, their activities and their achievements. For these reasons, there are positions that actually was very much in, in favor until recently. Uh, that talk uh, about an obvious alliance between uh, the growth and environmental justice movements in the Global South. But against this, uh, recently I realized that there was not a common position between the organizations that are part of visual about this point. So uh, I am interested in gaining views, or I was interested in gaining views from issues in the Global South about what they think really about the growth. And this is done with the final purpose of promoting alliances, but being careful of the difficulties in doing so. So I'm not alone, fortunately, in this endeavor. And uh, I have very, very good friends that uh, accepted um, to participate in, in this exercise. I cannot introduce them all now. Now maybe I can come back at the end of the, of the, of the presentation because of time constraints. But fortunately, we have Patrick Bond there in the audience. Uh, so what I did is basically uh, ask them these questions. 
see the questions. And uh, what they said confirmed in general that um, indeed the alliance between the environmental uh, um, justice movements and the growth movements is not as obvious as we thought. And then there are very good reasons for uh, saving, saying this. Um, you just consider, first of all, that the idea of the growth is not appealing in the South because of their own history and experience of poverty um, and scarcity. The use, the use of the word the growth is in itself negative and it goes against the mindset of everyone. And they say uh, what, the, the, what the people uh, principles are about living and working hard. Against uh, uh, this, growing has a positive meaning and there are things growing that actually environmental justice organizations are seeking, like healthy children's grow. No? Uh, they also believe that the voluntary growth can only be achieved through crisis uh, uh, and be directed to urban elites, but poor people instead assimilate the growth with austerity measures. They are not only concerned about the term the growth, but also what it is behind. No? Uh, they are some approaches on, on ideas, they, they feel different to, their own con uh, to what they see in their own context. For instance, they ask, uh, what does time allocation mean in an indigenous context? Uh, uh, they are particularly worried about the, dif the differences they perceive about how southern groups organize and discuss problems, since they are much more concrete in the use of words like strategy and tactics. They also feel that the growth is uh, too anthropocentric as, a, uh, anthropocentric as an approach. Indeed, they notice that there is a lack of dissemination of the ideas about the growth among certain groups, but then they ask, why do we believe this is happening? And they recall the causes that uh, I've just mentioned. Regarding communication issues, they point out to semantic controversies uh, that come together with calling our own movement uh, uh, as a denial of the false solution, and they use the example of uh, the term non-white that in South Africa is assimilated, is related to the rhetorics of uh, the upper hate. Uh, for this reason, other kind of languages is, uh, are suggested. Then, they warn us about uh, the growth being an Eurocentric uh, way of thinking, once again, uh, in history, it may be too individualistic and suppress, and this is what they are particularly uh, careful about, uh, the possibility for the local initiatives, both in the south but also in the north, to uh, flourish. But I've left, let's say, brace yourselves, because I left uh, for the end what uh, I think is the strongest concern about, uh, let's say, how environmental justice movements in the south see uh, the growth is that uh, BV, the growth, is not radical enough. Uh, although, I must say, this is not a shared perspective among all the people I've, uh, I've talked to about this. Uh, some groups uh, consider that the growth proposals in accommodating stances within the, the boundaries of the system, and they ask whether the growth is openly anti-capitalism, as they say they are, then they propose to move the discourse toward other alternative discourses like eco-socialism, recommoning, or uh, putting nature in the, uh, in, in the, in the focus of the, of the discourse. Then, after this, yet we have another finding which I think is, uh, is, is nice, that there is indeed, oh, sorry, you should say indeed, a possibility of an alliance. And this, is based on a variety of analogies between the core, the core themes, uh, sorry, I've used a co as a reference for core themes, the, uh, uh, the contents of what we had in the um, web page of research and degrowth. Probably we can approach this in a different way, but I think uh, it, it was useful for this exercise. Well, there are many analogies about the core themes in degrowth and the activities of these environmental justice organizations in the global south. And I just put here some examples of each one, but there are many. 
maybe we can as, uh, to focus the, the, the discussion, uh, see what is happening in relation to uh, the proposals in resource availability, what I think, uh, well, this is the, are the most clearly shared. And actually, I think we can see the uh, inspiration of many of the proposals in, of the growth debate in what is uh, this uh, discussion of living resources uh, not uh, use or no, not using resources as the strategy of living fossil fuels on the ground, but also paralyzing some uh, projects, extractivist projects that are for the benefit of the global north. The point is that in any case, these proposals should be assimilated uh, or transferred between contexts, but rather there are connecting points where uh, the movements and the groups can start uh, a, a dialogue. Then this dialogue can happen between the global south and the global north, between environmental justice organizations and movements, and be between the growth movements. Each one from their own standpoints, but being careful of the considerations that we have just mentioned. But then, for closing this um, invitation to the discussion, um, there is the possibility of an alliance, although this is clearly not so obvious as we may have seen and expected. Uh, recommendations to make progress in such an alliance start from the need of finding an alternative terminology that can be easily shared by the environmentalist, uh, by environmental justice groups and the degrowth groups. Uh, it is also necessary to disseminate more and better what we are doing in the context of the degrowth discussion in the global south. We also need to think strategically uh, differentiated more generic purposes and goal-oriented actions. And in this, we can start from identifying, exploring practical links from many of the points that we have seen, but the, 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 the people participating in this exercise even propose some specific ones, like, for instance, uh, as a, a, poor petro, uh, a poor petrochemical context in Darwin that is being developed, and it, it, it helps to connect initiatives. Or, for instance, they ask, what can the growth movement, movement do for the young Yasunidos that are now in a strong struggle trying to defend the Yasuni, the Taititi the Yasuni proposal? So basically, this is what I wanted to, to, to provide as a, as a feedback for the for the discussion. I hope I'm not extended too much. So, thank you. Great. I hope that I didn't promise too much. I think these are really thrilling and uh, important results, and we will come back. If you don't mind, I would, I would like to, to leave our colleagues here. Ah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. The protagonist of the whole thing. And you don't have time for it. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the gang. <laughs> um, yeah, very important results, I would say. And we will come back to the question whether we, there is a necessity to come up with common terms, term, um, common concepts, um, or an alternative terminology, maybe. Um, yeah, which are um, adapted to specific experiences, continents, countries, and others. But I would like to ask you now one question. What do you think uh, would have been the answer? And since Patrick is in the room, he can also yeah, yeah. add to this afterwards. Um, what do you think would be the, had been the answer when you asked not about growth, but about capitalist growth and about profit-driven growth? What is from the experience of the EJOL project? Would there be another, another let's say, um, take? Hmm. Well, this concern that they left for the, for the end, the idea that the main concern is that they don't see clearly if this big, the, if the big growth movement is anti-capitalism, is because they really think that we maybe are missing the point if we focus on growth, because they think capitalists are not particularly interested in growing more, but in getting get higher profits. If it is with more growth, that has been the strategy, I mean, it's a nice strategy so far, then clearly they are against growth. But uh, they say we, we should clearly be anti-capitalist, because it's there where we, uh, we find the, 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 in, the, uh, in the search of profits. Um, uh, 
we, even with the impacts we are seeing in the different cases in the in the age of the database, but in general, in many cases, when you can talk with uh, environmental justice organizations, what uh, you see there is that the emphasis is not in growth, but in the struggle against capitalism, according to their views. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, we are lucky here, we have Patrick and, and he can complement the response. Thank you. I think this is a very important point here for our, for our discussions, deliberations. And now I ask um, Ashish to um, introduce his thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, it's always difficult uh, coming in after my, my uh, much more exciting friend, Sunita Narayan. Um, but I think I'm going to take a slightly different view, so maybe that itself will generate some heat and controversy here. Um, <clears throat> let me start with a, um, a small village in central India which has coined a slogan which I think is a very, very interesting um, it sort of encapsulates in a very small way uh, something that we've been talking about. Um, and that comes from, of course, the old Indian concept of Swaraj, which kind of roughly, not so nicely translates as self-rule. But their slogan is, our government in Mumbai and Delhi, we are the government in our village. Um, and that's a, that's a concept of sort of deep, radical, direct democracy and emanating from that a whole lot of other ideas that actually actually come out of this. And what we've been doing in the last few years is to look at initiatives like this across India on many different fronts, many different kinds of themes, different geographical regions, different kinds of cultures, essentially where people are saying that we no longer are going to wait for governments and corporations to deliver the benefits that they have been promising but that we will do things ourselves. We will also try and hold the government accountable and responsible. But at least as far as basic needs are concerned, as far as learning and health and so on are concerned, we want to take control back in our own hands. So learning from these many, many hundreds of initiatives across, the, uh, across uh, India and, uh, and, and South Asia more generally, uh, some of us have uh, you know, brought up what we think is a, it's a very tentative initial framework of what an alternative vision could look like. Uh, again, coming from uh, the old Indian term Swaraj, which Gandhi made uh, famous. Uh, and we call it radical ecological democracy, and I think it's important to realize here that the word radical often gets uh, thought of as being extreme, but actually it simply means going to the roots. And so it's about going to one's ecological roots, cultural roots, social roots, uh, one's roots as a human being, or as, a, uh, as one amongst many species on Earth. Um, and, and so the idea is very simple. It's about people participating, being empowered to, and having the forums and institutions to participate in decision-making that affects their lives, but doing this while being ecologically sensitive and while being sensitive to the needs for socioeconomic justice and equity. And what this does is it actually places not the government, nor the corporation at the center of things, but the community. And the community, of course, defined in many different ways. One can say, let's say, the collective, uh, which could be a, a geographically-based collective, it could be a thematic-based collective, it could be a collective like these 2,000 people here. Uh, but essentially, it's, it's not, so therefore, it's actually in that sense, of course, it's anti-capitalist, but it's also anti-state domination. And I think these two, these two are, uh, it's very crucial because history has unfortunately been dominated by one or the other. Um, there are four key uh, ingredients. Um, in India, food is very important, so we, uh, the, word, the word ingredients is, is crucial for us. Uh, but essentially, it's about the first one which I already mentioned, which is direct uh, political democracy. But direct pol political democracy that's embedded within uh, larger structures of or institutions of decision making which are held accountable by the units of direct democracy at the village or at the town level. Uh, economic democracy has to go hand in hand with that which means the control over the means of production, the control over consumption by consumers or combining producers and consumers as prosumers, 
uh, the idea of self-sufficiency and localization for basic needs. And by basic needs, I don't mean only water, food, etc., but also health and learning. The third one of uh, social justice and equity. This is something that's absolutely crucial in a country like India, which has uh, fantastic traditional uh, and traditions of sustainability and so on, but also part of tradition and modernity has been uh, very high levels of inequality or injustice uh, uh, on the basis of caste and class and gender and so on. And finally, of course, uh, diverse knowledges and cultures and, and openness towards knowledge. So for instance, throwing out things like intellectual property rights. All of this, of course, on an ecologically, uh, on, an, on a base which recognizes ecological limits. Um, I don't have the time to go into these in detail. In the afternoon, we have another session where maybe I'll be able to elaborate this. But these are uh, the, the four or five absolutely crucial pillars or ingredients of a radical ecological democracy. Um, we can go back to uh, some of our uh, 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 inspiring predecessors. Um, uh, a Gandhian economist called uh, Kumarappa actually gave the term economics of permanence. Uh, which uh, I think is, is, it encapsulates this. I've twisted the word Earth Shastra, which in Hindi means uh, economics, a little bit of a twist here. Um, and I think what's most important in, it's not as if that central Indian village and the example I gave you is something that can be replicated elsewhere in India or elsewhere in the world. But it's about actually learning, and the reason, of course, is because there's an enormous diversity of cultures and ecologies and polities and so on. But the crucial thing with all of these examples and many of the others that you yourselves are practicing here in Europe is uh, what are the key values, the key principles that are emerging from this? And some of this is what I think Beatrice has also brought out. And I'm just going to list, uh, list out here uh, sort of a menu of values and principles. Uh, I'm not going to go into each of these in detail, these in detail, uh, but I think, uh, and, this is just, and this is just an initial list, and one can build on this. But just to be, I think the idea of diversity is absolutely crucial. And therefore, also this uh, notion of trying to actually have one common term for the kinds of world, the kind of world we want to go towards, whether it's degrowth or something else, is I think something that we should uh, not be trying, you know, trying for. It's, it's you know, we, we, there's absolutely a need for a diversity of terms, just like there is for a diversity of languages and ecologies and so on. Um, similarly, of course, we take uh, cooperation, solidarity in the commons. It's a, com it's a fairly common theme in this conference. Uh, the reason why I'm listing these uh, principles is because actually these are the ones which are directly opposite to what uh, modern um, capitalist neoliberal values, or lack of values actually, teaches us, and teaches especially kids in schools. And I think it's really important for us to actually work on what are the commonalities between what we're doing in terms of values. Now, I think there are a number of challenges that face something like radical ecological democracy, or degrowth for that matter. Um, it's not absolutely clear what are the key agents of change. Is it civil society? Is it political parties? Is it trade unions? Is it uh, somebody else? Uh, clearly, it's, it's not going to be academics only. Uh, but yeah, so that's, I think, I, I mean, I have my own ideas about this, but I think it's important that we discuss some of these, these questions. Um, we have a whole lot of scattered movements in South Asia as in the rest of the world. How do we actually create critical political mass out of these scattered movements? Do we want a state uh, in our ideal future? If so, what would be the nature of the state? What would be its response, responsibility and role? Uh, do we start questioning the nation state, uh, the very artificial political boundaries that our world has been, has been broken up into? Uh, should that be challenged? Uh, how do we look at uh, relations between the local to the global? So if we're talking about direct democracy at the local level, what would larger levels of democracy look like? What would global democracy look like? Clearly not the United Nations. Well, then what else? Um, and uh, of, co of course, then this creative tension between the individual freedoms and choices and the collective freedoms and choices, how do we, <coughs> how do we work uh, that tension out? Again, these are just a few of the questions. There are many more. <laughs> I think if we, if we compare uh, something like radical ecological democracy to degrowth, to, to the little extent that I understand degrowth, I think there's, there's uh, a great deal of commonality. I think our values, some of our values from what I've been hearing are fairly uh, common. 
Uh, I think both are striving towards holistic transformation. Uh, it's not just about piecemeal reforms within the current system. Both require, require a term that uh, I got from Ulrich, which is crossovers. He spoke about the need for crossover between the red and the green. But I also think, of course, between the tradition, the best in tradition and the best in modernity, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, the global north and south, which is what we're talking about here, between reason and spirituality, and many others. Uh, a lot of these have be unfortunately become dualities, uh, contested dualities, and I think there's a lot of possibilities of exchange and, and cross-learning amongst them. But there are also differences, and I think a little bit of what Beatrice has said comes out here also. Uh, there is in the Global South the reality of very large-scale deprivation, uh, and degrowth, therefore, will not resonate with uh, hundreds of millions of people. Uh, that doesn't mean that growth will resonate either, because we have seen, at least in India, that growth has not delivered what uh, should be to these deprived people. But therefore, the need for one's own vocabularies, uh, I, I think Latouche's A growth, or increasingly being used post-growth, could be uh, a term that we could look at uh, in the English, but of course in other languages we would have to look at other terms that uh, everybody is coming up with, and not to force one term across the world. Finally, then, uh, challenges of trying to uh, put degrowth approaches or radical ecological approaches or uh, Boin Viver kind of things, which Alberto will talk about. I think there are many, many challenges. Cross cultural exchange. Even sometimes the words that we use sound the same, but they mean very different things for us. Um, there are real life challenges of being able to communicate across cultures and languages which have to be overcome even concepts of time. So for instance, a lot of indigenous people would find this kind of a, conf this kind of a session very difficult because 12 minutes, cut off at 12 minutes and I have to finish my work. It just, we don't work often like that. You know, there's, you give yourself space and time and relaxed chatting, etc., to understand each other. Um, but of course, there are then power hierarchies. Uh, English tends to still dominate um, our world. Um, and if you have global exchanges, that still tends to happen. Um, there are people who have much greater access to communications technologies than others do, etc. So there are uh, power hierarchies that have to be dealt with. with. There are nationalistic barriers. Uh, I don't particularly think that the Indian nation state is, uh, should be there as a nation state. Nevertheless, uh, um, you know, it's, it's so deeply ingrained in me that the, the, you know, the concept of India, Germany, etc. does come in. And, then trying to talk across peoples of the world is not so easy. And finally, of course, then the temptations to universe, universalize a good model, whether it is degrowth here or something else, somewhere else, we say, well, the whole world can adopt something like this. And I think we need to resist that temptation. So I think these are the challenges of being able to work together, uh, but they're just challenges. The necessity of working together and doing cross-cultural exchanges, learning from each other and building that greater global solidarity and political movement is absolutely essential. I mean, this is something that even local communities um, who are not necessarily in constant touch with the global, with what's happening around the world, do recognize from the conversations that I've had with them. And so therefore the need for uh, understanding common values, but diversity of context and so on, learning from the innovations and methods and pathways that each one of us is trying out, uh, jointly exploring how we could work towards more equitable global relations. Uh, so globalization not in the form of financial global uh, power, but more in terms of much more cultural exchanges, etc., which of course has been going on for 5,000 years and needs to continue at even uh, greater uh, levels. And uh, jointly then exploring what global governance could look like, which is centered on peoples of the world rather than nation states. So that's a few thoughts. Um, thank you very much. I hope I've kept your time. Well, thank you very much. There are some really, really good ideas. I would also say that in the, in the terminology of um, Beatrice, there is an analogy concerning a broad um, and, um, understanding of democracy. In, um, concerning your experiences and the degrowth debate, even the economic democracy, um, um, questioning um, property rights and others. I wanted to ask you the question about uh, 
how would the degrowth concept resonate in, 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 in India, but you already answered it and, and very in line with um, Bea's um, um, investigation. Um, and you, you um, insisted in this cross-cultural learning and exchange of experience, and I would like to ask you, having been here for um, those two days and having heard um, the degrowth debate, to be a bit more precise, what would be you, you gave us a general, um, uh, some general um, 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 thoughts. At the more concrete level, what would be one, two, three ideas coming from the experiences of India um, to integrate, to con consider for the degrowth proposal here, to be a bit more precise? Besides that we should be more relaxed. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think... Uh, we, we all come from uh, cultures and histories which are extremely diverse and some are a few thousand years old, some are a few hundred years old, but we all have this. And I think what tends to happen uh, in conversations which are brief and short is that this, this history and these contexts kind of get a little bit submerged or generalized. I think therefore uh, the possibility of being able to understand notions of well-being or notions of happiness or notions of uh, satisfaction and so on uh, from different parts of the world. And Albert and I have been talking about maybe doing something like this. Uh, and then uh, doing that in a relaxed, relaxed atmosphere, really getting a, a proper deep understanding of that. I think if we could do that, uh, and some of it is happening here, but much more needs to be done, I think it would be amazing because I think it would be very powerful antidote and very powerful cro uh, counter current to the dominant uh, models that we are being told. Uh, the second very crucial thing I think is, is uh, uh, being able to understand and, and, and um, even know about the fantastic initiatives and experiments that are happening on the ground. It's always, uh, it's always very inspiring and it gives, if, if I'm involved in any of those in my community, it gives me great strength and hope that there's another hundred out there, not just in India, but around the world. And I think, therefore, some possibilities of ease of being able to understand and, and, and you know, document and, and exchange uh, initiatives would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I ask um, Alberto for his presentation. You can generate it. There's no power button. Sure. Just come, if you like. Sí. Sí, Ah, okay. Muy buenos días a todas. Hello, welcome, good morning. It is a great motivation to be here here in Leipzig and also what we experienced here in Leipzig in 2014. But at the same time, I'm a little bit sad. Because unfortunately, I cannot take part in all the events that I would like to participate in. I don't really know how I could possibly grasp all the opportunities that are offered here, I think we actually experience something really new. We experience the creation of something new. At the same time, I have the feeling that it is about things that we already knew and that are present here. Yesterday, I had the wonderful possibility to take part in a session where we discussed uh, the ideas of Ivan Illich. I think uh, this moment could be a historic opportunity, an opportunity to rethink the world. It has never been easy to link social movements in the global north and the global south. I am still working on the subject of uh, foreign debt. For, for many years, for decades, the Global North promised us solidarity 
when you were talking about debt and about the problems of neoliberalism of the World Bank and of the FMI. And I can see that things can also be different and that we can re-stress the importance of projects like EGELD that Beatrice has presented to us. 1,200 systematic or systemic conflicts are cited in this project. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done, but we can also already see how diverse the situations in our world are, and we have to acknowledge the problem of extractivism. The origin of our movements has been laid several hundred years ago when the people resisted against the destruction of uh, la labor, against the destruction of environment, and against the destruction of water, for example. In the end of the 19th century, there were people in, in Japan um, struggling against a copper mine in Japan. So these resistances and struggles, these resistances and struggles have a long history, and we have developed a map, a map of um, conflicts that shows us what is going right now. The struggles are not only uh, resistance struggles, but also it is about alternatives. I could talk about many examples in our countries where we have these. Um, structures and these struggles. In Europe there was a big resistance against the privatization of water and there was a referendum of the people where well, the people decided that they did not want the water to be privatized. So how can we uh, find alternatives? We have the possibility to create alternatives we can recreate communities and we can create um, democracy. Ashish Kuthari was talked about the radical democratic ecolo economy. This is a very important struggle. There are answers coming from the inside of the communities and not from the universities. Universities have to support these uh, struggles and movements, but they also have to respect these movements. These alternatives and resistances can also happen via the Internet, but the basis The basis why this is important to happen is a capitalism that wants to colonize and capitalize the climate, for example, via the CO2 certificates. Our resistances and our, um, our struggles are threatened to be taken over. They want to take over our struggles. And they want to, for example, in the USA, compare the good life with the green economy. They don't also only want to colonize the climate, but also our own ideas and our alternatives, our strategies. We also have to think about how we want to cope with the transnational um, companies. For example, in Ecuador, there's the struggle against Texaco. They don't take their responsibility. And there are many activists who actively resist against this company. We did have alternatives, alternatives for a change. But now we can see that this struggle 
was not success successful. Now again, there is the possibility that biodiversity is being catalyzed. And that genetical engineering will be allowed. There are many examples, for example, the constitution of Ecuador. But in reality and in practice, the governments usually do not work against the um, against capitalism and against the companies. The degrowth movement does not only have to criticize degrowth, but also development. We have to say goodbye to the idea of development. And we have to open the doors to diverse and multi um, alternatives and possibilities. I teach the theory of development and I have been doing so for a long time. But I see that I am teaching something that is like a dead star, a star that is already dead but that we still see. We could also abolish poverty without growing. I could cite many examples how to do that and many um, alternatives. One Ecuadorian politician said that we could just simply redistribute wealth and that wouldn't be an easy path to, to abolish poverty. But it's not only about redistribution. We do not only have to redistribu redistribute the cake, but we have to bake a new cake. Not only redistribute that what we have, income and property, but we rather need a new structure of consummation. Beatrice also talked about another important point. Not everything is clear, not all the alliances between the North and the South are clear, but we have some leverage points. In the North, um, we have an environmentalism that departs from the idea of uh, wealth. But in the South, the environmentalist movement is different. It's a humanitarian movement. The global treaties will not give answers to us, probably, but we have other possibilities to collaborate. This is what I want to say to you. We are living in a historic period. In my country, the indigenous movement was very strong and offered their own alternatives. Those alternatives were not new. They were old. They had a long tradition it's about the good life. This is Kwasai. This idea tells us that there is something else, something else that has been existing for a long time. This has been existing long, long before the um, English people had come to South America. The good life is an alternative that it has been um, and the alternative for a long time with a long tradition in our continent and that can be found everywhere now. It is the possibility to, re to recreate a new world. And it includes the practices that, that we have to change the way we do things. We have to make bridges between the global north and the global south in order to create a world where we can all have a good life. To, um, this evening uh, at 8, uh, this, there is go going to be a book presentation by Barbara Muraka about the good life. 
This is a sign that we are already coming together in the debate. But what we need is really a link of our struggles. We have to see clearly what is our reality, what are our struggles, and what is our vision. We have to see our common path. And these transitions show us how the things should be done. The current struggles are a resistance, and finding alternatives is imperative now. But in order to do so, we should also bear in mind the ideas of the good life. We need a world without injustice, without poverty, without hunger, where we all can live in dignity together. These diverse transformations have to become a big transformation. And this is my message to you. Thank you. Muchas gracias al doctor por, por um, esta intervención. Um, I will ask Alberto now one question and then um, I ask you if you like to comment already on this, what you heard from the others, and then we will open uh, to the auditorium. Um, Alberto, um, having heard a, a question similar to uh, which I um, asked um, Ashish, having heard the debates here, and you know quite well the degrowth uh, proposal, and now you announce also um, Barbara Moraka's book, would you suggest to replace or at least to open um, very quickly the degrowth proposal and degrowth debate towards a uh, debate about the buen vivir, the good life, the buenos convivires? Or do you see still, um, and you know quite well uh, Europe, you still see a potential within the degrowth debate and the degrowth concept itself? Personalmente tengo algún problema con el concepto de decrecimiento. Ya sé, es un concepto obus. Actually, for me, the term degrowth or the, the concept degrowth is actually uh, a, bit, a bit difficult for me or I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that uh, that concept because for us in the global south um, it is it is it is difficult to understand why should we uh, reduce our growth or degrowth when we don't have anything in the first place so that somehow goes against uh, what we perceive as our dignity not to be able to grow in order to meet our needs. So it's not only about the concept or the, the, the sub substance of the term, but also the strategies that are connected to it. So we have to remain open to, to other perspectives and to other pathways. And this can be very, this can have very positive effects. In my work and over the last years, I've tried to learn from people in different countries. And from the so-called underdeveloped world, I learned a lot about human and interpersonal relationships. And not only that, I also learned from, from Pierre Ravi. I learned about issues of sufficiency from authors here in Germany. But these are perspectives from a world that has an abundance of things and a surplus, an ex excess of things. 
So we have to rethink all of these issues. Yesterday I learned about perspectives from Italy. Now the question is, how do we bring together all of those perspectives that are grassroots perspectives, and how do we translate these perspectives into a transformation? How, do we, how can we interconnect these perspectives to bring about a new world, a different world. Uh, well, a very brief uh, comment, sorry, which uh, is uh, that I like the, the yeah, no, and um, in the in the presentation from, from my colleague uh, speakers, in this idea of there is not an homogeneous general universal response, but we should take care of what we see in the different contexts. As long as we are respectful of the recognition of these differences, these, there is a huge potential of all kind of alliances. This, this would be for me kind of the connecting threads uh, mm -hmm. among our respective talks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just a quick thought from uh, which it was stimulate, stimulated when uh, Alberto was speaking is that I think all of us are kind of saying that a lot of what we are learning and saying here is from local communities, from grassroots organizations uh, and, and, and people. And I think one of the things that's missing in global debates very often is those people themselves. And I would not even speak on their behalf, but I think we need far more to have the voices of the indigenous peoples and the local communities coming to forums like this and being able, and, and us being, you know, facilitating that kind of cross-cultural exchange of communities themselves and, and, and not just activists and researchers. So I, so I think that's a crucial additional step that you would need. Thank you. Very fruitful. Thank you. So now the floor is open and we have, I think, two microphones. And please, um, raise your hands. And I saw one. OK, there's. We start over there. There's a woman in the middle with one mic. Jóvenes y mujeres. Sí, por supuesto. They're in the middle. Tenemos varias preguntas. Sí. And then the second mic goes to this person, and that is the third one. Please. Hello. And if you like, you can introduce yourself. Yeah, ich bin Christina. Uh, I'm Christina. Thank you very much for your inspiring talks. My question refers to trade. Sorry. Sorry, Christina. <laughs> okay, it's channel one, huh? German was two, channel two. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, vielen Dank für die interessanten Vorträge. Thank you very much for your inspiring talks. My question concerns an issue that has not been raised, which is trade. We heard about it a lot yesterday. Degrowth posits that we have to change trade, uh, and first and foremost that we have to reduce trade. And I was wondering, from a perspective, from a southern perspective, what is your take on that? What, is your, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have positive or negative consequences that you would like to highlight with it in terms of uh, trade? And what would be uh, preconditions um, for the North to reduce trade? Thank you. Hello. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, all the panel members for their viewpoints and all. Okay. Uh, and if I get it rightly, and all of them highlighted, I mean, the alternative ways of, say, good life or other kind of developments or the pathways that are, that are already been there in the different global south since age old. I mean, for example, if you take the case of India, where I'm a bit uh, aware about it, I mean, the Gandhian organizations and the concept the Gandhi highlighted 
during the freedom and before that i mean they there is a good synergy between what they talked at that time between some of the concepts we discussed about degrowth for example it might be sufficiency localization etc etc so my question would be uh, in particular to ashish and in general to all others so there have always been this kind of alternative pathways and some have already been taking up to a uh, some considerable level but they have always uh, failed to come to the mainstream for example if we take the case of india i think many of the concept like sufficiency subsistence good living and and also i should thank ashish for bringing in the spiritual dimension and other stuff there have been like these concepts have been since age old i mean they are not new but when it comes to mainstream they have always failed to come in the mainstream that is one the second thing is even now after all these years for example if we see the present uh, indian government and all they still want to go with the growth paradigm so there is a con contradictory thing i mean how can we or what strategy can be there so that these concepts that are already there can become more in a uh, significant way or mainstream thank you i to put a headset because the sound here is uh, very bad so please raise the hands who is asking for the floor okay then we have here a woman and then for us and then i ask again <laughs> no because you raised your hand i'm sorry to have a quote yeah please and then here it goes for the first person okay thank you sometimes i'm really glad well not sometimes always that i'm a woman so at least i can take the floor um i'm Leira Reina from the eeb the environmental um, european environmental movement bureau from brussels and quite active in the de world movement and also in this kind of alliances uh, between north and south um i think when we for me economic growth is one of the drivers of injustice so i think yes it is very good that we focus on 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 degrowth but not degrowth as such but just the concept of of attacking the economic growth uh, fetishes i think if if i looked at the questionnaire of 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 Bea on on how people think in the south about degrowth i think it's it's maybe maybe a little bit wrong framing of the questions i mean we never ask for degrowth in the south i think nobody in the degrowth movement would ask for degrowth in the south but degrowth for the, the global north in the south yes because that's i think very important important um, for me, it goes out contraction and convergence. So we need to degrow in the global north to give space for growing in the south. I mean, it, it's just this question, I think. And it's also about accountability. It's also about accountability, the corporations that go to the south uh, for, for having land grabbing for our vegetables in the north. I think it's about that. It's also about recognizing ecological debt. So I really think that uh, we will never promote degrowth in the south as such, but you can use the concepts that, that go behind it. And all the proposals are very valid in, in the south as well. And I agree that it's not easy to communicate it, but it's also not easy to communicate it here. I mean, the same south. There is more extreme wealth in the south than in the north. I think that's kind of things we also have to recognize in this whole debate. Thank you. Please, yeah, it's Arab. Please don't get nervous. I saw you and I asked you again to raise your hand and we have time for contributions and for discussions. Um, please, Tim, it's him. Um, yes, hello, my name is Aaron. And first of all, I would like yes. to yeah. very much thank the panelists. I cannot recall a panel where all three contributions were so enriching and interesting. <laughs> um, my question is the following. Um, listening to, especially to Alberto and to Ashish, I've heard many, many things which resonated with a, with a certain concept. I've, I've heard um, the idea of overcoming the dichotomy between reason and spirituality, um, of combining traditional and modern elements. I've heard references to Illich. I've heard um, the resistance against extractivism. All these things are quite familiar to me from the post-development debates, from Escobar, Esteva, and from the Gandhian tradition in India. So my question would be, um, would you say that maybe post-development would be a concept that would resonate more with the social movements in the South that you work with? Or would you say that it basically would encounter the same criticisms that you were leveling against the degrowth concept here. So please raise your hands. Who would like to speak? And over there, please. Yeah, just here in the middle. Please, here at the right. There. No, at the other side. Yeah. 
And then we go back to the podium and then we have a second round. Yeah, and then a third round as well. Okay, please. Um, I would, would like to raise the question which was already asked by Ashish about the who can be the key agents in uh, establishing a new I don't know, form of economy or how you would like to call it and whether the actors um, are different in the north than in the south and how they can um, work together and uh, cooperate. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, and important questions. And now our challenge is that no, not everybody has to answer, of course, each question. Some were um, directed um, exactly to, to a person. But I hope that we will come to comprehensive answers to all the questions. And I ask Bea to start. Thank you all for your very interesting questions. I think Christina has, 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 uh, has touched this uh, important, very important, important, very important uh, point uh, related with trade. I've not said what EJOL stands for, but these environmental justice organizations' liabilities, in the line of what Elliot has said, and trade. So we think that trade has a, a basic role in uh, facilitating that the, the Global metabolism is growing based on the extraction of resources in the south mostly, um, and also in dumping uh, wastes also in the in the south, not only in the uh, in the atmosphere, but also direct dumping of resources in the south, as in the case of uh, sea breaking, as it happens in Alang in India. So. Uh, in principle, we don't see uh, trade as something that is uh, the solution unless you reduce it somehow in terms of volume. Because both uh, because of the nature of the commodities traded, but also uh, because of the uh, mechanism facilitating, enable, uh, enabling trade. This means large infrastructures, it means uh, big ships uh, going around, it means use of fossil fuels. Uh, more trade is going to be always more problems in relation to environmental justice struggles. No? Uh, I, I understand the <coughs> sorry, Ancha uh, Leida's point, and of course we are not uh, asking uh, the the communities to not grow or to degrow, of course. This was an exercise that was agreed among the people that participated. What are the questions that may be interesting to do to see how the different people? So first, there was a process of agreeing the questions. Then we must remind, as uh, Patrick reminded me yesterday, yesterday, that there is um, uh, south in the global north, but there is also a north in the global south, and this is that we have to see very carefully in terms of how the new demands in the global south are increasing, and maybe these are the users of these discursive, uh, uh, of the degrowing discourse, but we are well aware that degrowing does not mean strictly uh, the, the decreasing size of the, uh, let's say, monetary economy, but it goes together with many other uh, ideas that I think is where we can find these analogies and, and points of contact. Uh, I think for the rest, uh, it's better that uh, uh, my colleagues uh, <laughs> use their chances to, <laughs> to, to Thank you. participate. Thank you. <coughs> um, I think each of these questions requires a full session in itself. Uh, on trade, um, my view is that uh, we need to look at trade from two points of view. Uh, one is if there is long distance trade which actually creates a debilitating dependence of a community on somebody else far away buying their things, that's a huge problem. Um, so if the principle of self-sufficiency, localization and embeddedness and subsidiarity, sorry all jargon, uh, is so essentially to say that in, in my local area, and that could be not just my village, of course, or my town, but a small eco-region, uh, uh, I, sh I need to be self-sufficient on basics. Beyond that, there could be trade. 
the terms of which again need to be set from that direct democracy uh, uh, in terms of decision making. Um, and so the, the, the concept of uh, localization of basic needs and of self-rule, if these are met, then we will find that the nature of trade, long distance trade, actually changes substantially. So you might still get your coffee in Europe, uh, but it will be on the basis of those communities who are producing that coffee not being dependent on your having to drink the coffee or to buy their coffee. That's actually the question. Yeah. So, so that's on trade. Uh, and of course, it then means substantially dismantling uh, current you know, WTO or other sorts of trade regimes. Um, uh, from my Indian colleague, the failure of alternatives to come mainstream, well, firstly, I think um, I would actually be hesitant to for the alternatives to become the mainstream. I'm very scared of the word mainstream because the mainstream means it's actually flooding everything else. So if any of these alternatives becomes the mainstream, it floods out other alternatives. So I think the principle of diversity is really crucial. So what we're talking about here is billions of streams and not one mainstream. Um, now, however, the question of how does this become politically more uh, powerful so that it pushes out the current dominant uh, flood uh, is absolutely important. Um, I think one of the things we have been not very good at is for all these different uh, alternatives to actually come together and become a greater, greater political mass. We've, we've uh, relied too much on political parties, etc., to uh, have our voice uh, felt in larger circles. I think we need to uh, get away from that and actually start saying, okay, how do we get the justice movements, the gender movements, the sustainable agricultural movements, the water movements, etc., together to create that critical critical mass. And I should just mention you, uh, especially into others interested, we are in fact starting a process like that called Alternatives Confluence. Uh, in Hindi, it's, it's Sangam, uh, which is, uh, so the confluence of two rivers has always been a sacred spot. Can we think of the confluence of alternative movements around, in our case, we're doing it in India, but, but around the world, so that it becomes a greater political mass? Uh, I think that's crucial. Uh, last couple of points, I don't want to answer everybody, but uh, I think you said would post-development resonate more? Uh, let's please get away from thinking of single terms as resonating around the world. Let's list out what are the key values and ethics and principles that we want and let everybody have their own terms. And let's create that space to understand each other's terms. I may say Swaraj or something else, you might say degrowth or post-development, post-growth, etc. Let's have a thousand little uh, terms, but let's understand them and, and see what are the sort of common elements uh, uh, arising from that. Uh, who would be the key agents? <laughs> For me, I mean, that's a very difficult question, but I really think that at the moment I would put my bet on people's movements. And people's movements, I don't, uh, I mean, especially grassroots, community, mobilization, resisting the current uh, destructive models and creating the alternatives. I think that's, that's, that would be the vanguard of the future and the rest of us need to follow and support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alberto. Ich habe schon gelernt. Langsam, aber es kommt. La primera pregunta que tiene relación con el comercio. The first question about trade. It is a very basic question. Already Rosa Luxemburg said that trade was or had been a motor for all countries. And there are countries that have exploited other countries more and they have created de dependencies. And so this has become the source of poverty. So what is the trade? What is the trade that we currently have? There are countries that export nature countries that are under development and countries that are developed import nature. And that has been our reality for years and we need answers for that. 
We have to demolish all these elements that are based on speculation. Today, speculation is a characteristic of our world. Karl Marx said in his third chapter about a banker who said that it is, was difficult to see the boundaries where we leave the financial activities and start speculation. So that is, of course, about capitalistic economy. So, and this is exactly why we have more speculation in our capitalist world. The dimensions of speculations are horrible. And the amount of speculation that is happening is about 5.3 billion dollars and this has nothing to do with trade. The German, German bank has 16% of their transactions in the domain of money. The value of the reunification was about 2 million euros. So we have to see the relations that we're talking about, the scale that we're talking about. Everything about trade is speculative. Also, for example, the selling of um, of gold or oil is highly speculative. We only use 10% of gold in the economy and the rest is used for speculation. There exist progressive governments who want to extract even more in order to increase speculation. So what are free trade agreements? They are not free and they are not only about trade because trade has never been free. The Chinese market was opened with cannons and so that is how the British started the opium trade in China with cannons. And we also see what is happening at the moment in other countries. We should, of course, consume local products and not import, for example, tomatoes uh, from very distant countries, which has an impact on our environment, of course. I was talking about a citation. I'm going to cite Keynes, actually, which might be unbelievable about you. I want to tell you what Keynes said in the year of 33 at a conference that is not very known, but which I recommend to you. He said that he was a friend of those who want to minimize and not maximize that what is happening between countries. On an international level, we should have traveling and the exchange between people, but we should produce our products as far as possible on a local level. And this should happen on a national level. So this is how we should rethink our economy. But uh, sorry, these questions are so interesting, I have to keep talking. Where are the rights of the South? The growth in the South. We have to pay attention. We have a right to growth, but not eat every growth. 70% of the exportations of oil was in our hands, and we had a growth of 10%, but we still we did not develop. Peru has a growth rate, almost like China, of 8%, but there is no development. There is good growth and bad growth. I think it is better to grow less, but in a better way. And each growth, each country has a environmental history. The fetishism of growth 
has to be eliminated and we have to see how we grow. The good life cannot be constructed around growth. Growth is a means but not a goal as itself. The, the other question about tradition and modernity, I think this is also a basic question. What about technology? Technology? Why? Technology is never socially and environmentally neutral. In Ecuador, there is a huge resistance against the extraction of oil. There is Sarayaco, which is a village that can be compared to the village of, village of Asterix and Obelix because they are resisting. Resisting against the ex extractivist companies. Summa Kasai, the good life, is our goal. And this is why we use technologies in this in this village the people have solar panels on their houses they generate energy via solar panels they also have a computer center an IT center and they are connected to every um, everyone in the world in order to show solidarity we can ask a question that also Marx used to ask the question whether we understand that we are a social organism that has to profit from technology or whether we are dominated by technology. And there are those people living in resistance. Exactly those people should be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. So we open the second round, and we have here in the first row, we have here in the first row, a colleague. Yes, please. My name is Pawan. I'm from India. Uh, I'm very glad I came for this session because there are so many parallel sessions going on, and it's difficult to, uh, you know, choose. Uh, happy that I came here. And I liked what Ashish said about common values. I think that's very important. But uh, what I feel, you cannot really come to common values unless we have the space for different languages of the world. Especially when we talk of the South, the languages of the South need to be brought in, not as a tokenism, but with full respect. And that, I don't know how it will happen, because this is a cultural issue, you know. We, we are talking of uh, uh, North being in the South. There is a North in the South as well. Now, what is common in North all over the world, whether the North exists in the geographical South or not, common between all the North is the language. The languages have become languages of the North, the look the geographical north, be it an English, of course, predominant. When we talk of common values, these values can only be arrived if you dig into your history also. If you dig into your past as well and find out what was good there and what was bad there. When you do that, and if you're alienated from your own language, and you s adopt a different language, which I'm doing just now, then you also slowly stop thinking in a very authentic manner. Your thoughts, because the effort is to communicate to the other who doesn't understand your language, and in that attempt, your uh, idioms change. You use words which you don't like to use, but you don't have an alternative. So the meaning somewhere gets lost. The, the subtlety of the meanings. And I think, I don't know how we will overcome this, but unless the issue of language is really addressed, and I'm not talking of mutual tolerance, I'm talking of mutual respect, which someone, you know, many people have said. So how do we 
bring in the, the smaller languages or languages like uh, many languages in India are spoken by a large number of people, many more than you know, most European countries, but they are still marginalized. And we spoke about bringing those people into these kind of forums, you know, the ordinary people, people who are struggling. They don't speak English. They don't speak other languages. And when they come here, I've seen with my own experience, when they come here, it's very good. They have a good time. They see because West is a big thing in India, coming to the West, having an opportunity to come to the West. But when they come here, actually they go back feeling a little small for various reasons. They get very self-conscious. How will we address all these issues? I mean, I, I have no of singers who I used to love to hear folk singers from Rajasthan, Manganyas and Langas. But the moment they started coming to the West, now it's become very difficult for me to listen to them because they don't play for us anymore. So there are various such issues which I think there are no easy answers, but we need to be sensitive to them and maybe have a discussion around these uh, vague but uh, important issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Please raise your hand. Who would like to have the floor? I, 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 please, then it's you too. And, My question to the, all, the three of you, or the four of you, is do you want to influence the thinking and the actions of policymakers in your countries and also internationally? And if you want to influence their thinking and their actions, what are the ways you, th you can do that? What's, what are you doing currently and what would you like to see happening, e supporting each other, etc.? And it's Isabella, over there, and then you. Thank you. Uh, I also see a strong link between environmental justice movement and the extractivism in the global south and north, and degrowth in the north and possibly in the south, in the question or in the challenges that this poses to democracy, which certainly has to be contextualized in the places. And I want to get back to the contribution from Kotari Ashish, because you mentioned the importance of pluralism, and I know the Bolivian and Ecuadorian debates on plurinational states and intercultural democracies, which I, found extremely, which I find extremely interesting. And my question is, if these debates, so what pluralism means for democracy is also strong in India, or what relevance it has in the context of a radical ecological democracy? Thank you. So then now it's up to you, but please, one, one microphone should go very to the end of the executive, to you, to the end of the room, but here first, oh, is it, the floor is yours. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Uh, I have not much experience globally, uh, but my, uh, my experience, what I see, and uh, I actually am from India, and I'm studying in Germany now. The main question I have is, Parents across the world, whether it be global north or global south, they are sending the children and the youth to the schools and the universities, which teach them the concepts of globalization, the concepts of industrialization, which they feed since their, since their birth until the end of their graduation. And they are taking all these concepts and all these opportunities of globalization and industrialization into their minds. We are not great. There are no universities or schools which are teaching localization. There are no, uh, I just give an example of my own family actually. My sister has a baby of three years and uh, he is just going to a baby school now. In the, in the school, they only speak English. The teachers and everybody, they speak only English. I'm actually from India with and my mother tongue and my, uh, the, the language is different. But all the schools in, in India, mostly they, are, they speak only English. They don't speak anything else. If, if the whole world is actually uh, doing like this, then we will end up nowhere with the concepts of localization. The youth of the countries, they don't know all these things. How we are going to do this transformation in, in the schools? Because I think the, the percentage of youth in the, in the developing countries is really huge. 
So I think we need to focus also on this. Mm -hmm. Please, that's up to you. Um, Die werden dann auf Deutsch sprechen. Ich komme ursprünglich aus Chile. Hold on. I come from Chile, but I will talk in German. And I'm from the generation of the 1970s. During that time, the world development was a word of struggle. So this is why it is difficult for me, because I th think that term should um, be eradicated. Because at that time, it was a word about um, struggling for independence. It was very clear that development is different from growth. It m also means self-reliance and independence. But at the same time, it means that modern science and technolo technology were also included in the term. And our struggle was about the question how the different countries that were being treated as underdeveloped could come to a level, to, a to the same technological level as the industrial nations. Now we know that this is an illusion mainly for, for ecological reasons. But I think that is, it is hard to abandon some things. For example, the term of development as capacitation. The, the poorer countries have to have the capacity to develop their knowledge and their skills, because otherwise they will be independent and they will go down. Another important point is the fact that modern science, well, you see, I am a great critic of the modern science, but I don't think that we can abandon modern science. You cited an example about a village that was uh, supported by um, solar energy and computer technology, they are dependent on the industrializing countries producing computers and solar panels. I think the question is very complex. Then we go back to the front. Please, uh, here and then Patrick, and then we come back to the podium. No, it's now him and then Patrick. Um, thank you. I'll speak in English. My name is Hans Farrell. My, my work in the past, um, becoming an old white man, has been with the Commons, pastoralists in Gujarat and uh, East Africa. And um, for the past decade, even more than that, I've worked on international climate gov governance. Um, and the question that bugs me is, are we the, al the eternal alternative? Or can the confluence of alternatives that Ashish just spoke about embrace the societal center? So can we be the, ma the new mainstream? And what might and this is a question to the panel, what might a values-based vocabulary be in your country, in your language, um, where we unify people so that the middle class is no longer af afraid of eternal class struggle or falling back into poverty, which I think is a fear that drives um, opposition to alternatives. Um, so can you, can you come give us words or concrete demands that actually mobilize the middle class and that aspire um, those people um, that are currently still poor. Thank mm -hmm. you, um, I'm Patrick Bond from Durban, South Africa. I'm a petty bourgeois academic and therefore in the global north, uh, in a place that has lots of global south victims who struggle very hard against processes, processes that create growth of profits in the north and a degrowth of life and environment in the South. And those, to me, are missing from our debate processes because they give us the alliances we need against common enemies. Just two quick examples. The Bayer Corporation, your biggest uh, German, uh, German chemical and pharmaceutical company, they lost a lawsuit in 2010 in India uh, where they were trying to keep their monopoly patents. And because they lost, uh, CIPLA and other generic producers can make some very important medicines. 
uh, now as generics. In Durban, where I live, we have more HIV-positive people than anywhere in the world. The degrowth in bearish profits resulted in a growth of life expectancy from 52 years in 2004 to 62 years today in South Africa because the antiretroviral medicines, the ARVs of these big corporations, are now available free. In 2004, they cost $10,000 a year. The degrowth of northern profits and the growth of life expectancy was a process, just as, as, he, as she said, it wasn't Jim Young Kim at the World Health Organization. Yeah, he was, okay, helpful then. But it was treatment action campaign, a mass movement that protested against the commodification and stratification uh, and the northern production of these medicines. The second is that we do have with the climate uh, the three words loss and damage that came into the Doha negotiations in 2012. And those are interesting because something Hillary Clinton introduced in Copenhagen, a green climate fund allows for some transfer, some climate debt to be paid to those in the south and including in the south within the north, who are the victims. And I think very quickly, the beauty of what Beatrice put up is the first use of the words environmental justice. Warren County, North Carolina, PCB dumping, got some comp compensation from the Superfund. And the compañeros in, in uh, Accident Ecologica and, uh, and Conai and uh, Alberto looking for Yasuni to be the, similarly a climate debt payment, a down payment, would be one of those areas where a process where the North profits have grown at the expense of South life can be reversed if we get the processes, the uneven and combined development of capitalism. Uh, we can call it degrowth too. Thanks, comrades. Thank you. So I suggest that we extend the session until three o'clock because it's so incredibly uh, interesting. But since hunger will come and we want to chat also in a more bilateral, trilateral level uh, um, 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 settings, we should um, close at once. So, so each presenter has five minutes and it's very, of course, very difficult to stick to these five minutes. Then I will yeah, conclude for myself and I will throw, throw out two or three points which I found really interesting in this debate and make some announcements and then we close at one o'clock. So, Beatrice. No, thank you, Ajoin. Uh, in uh, embracing your questions, um, I will uh, touch some points, um, not, re not necessarily in the same order you, um, you made the questions, but I will start with the um, issue language. Uh, being, uh, being Catalan myself, self, uh, I'm very sensitive on this. Uh, I think uh, the way how I feel resolved it is, uh, is, is trying to approach the other in the way how he or she better understands me. And if I feel that the other understands me in my own language, I, I, I use it. But if I feel, feel that uh, using another language facilitates communication, I, th I use another language, uh, as I'm doing here. I don't know whether this is improving communication necessarily. Uh, but yes, I, I, I join any initiative that uh, encourages uh, the use of, uh, uh, well, their own language. And I think for this is uh, basic, and I link with uh, an intervention from this side, uh, uh, enhancing plurality in the schools and recognizing diversity, cultural diversity in formal education. This is how I learned, actually, uh, master say Catalan because uh, the original conditions of the way how my language is, 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 uh, is spoken were, were weakened for political reasons. So I, my, my language is stronger because I learned it in the school, not because I learned it through my social context. So it's necessary to strengthen formal education in uh, plurality. Uh, I lived some years in, in Mexico and uh, it was sad how, how the uh, hispanophobic, uh, hispanophonic, sorry, 
um, culture has imposed to everything else in the schools and how diversity, the, the very rich diversity of the Mexican and the Mesoamerican cultures is not present, or at least not present as, it, as, as much as it should be there. So, regarding the concrete proposals, uh, well, I think we should influence uh, our policy makers because by the time being, being they are there for, for making their job. And uh, concrete, in concrete terms, I would like to see in, uh, in uh, my country a uh, more, uh, I guess, um, say a more prominent recognition of the issue of environmental injustice uh, ter territorially. No? How this is influenced, or, or how certain territorial inequalities ha have been not only uh, corrected, but even uh, um, increased because of current, say, Productivist uh, policies, as the as how we produce energy or how infrastructures have been uh, have been um, uh, developed. Then I think if we recognise the problem in our own countries, then we have to recognise also the impact that our countries are causing in the rest of the world. So I would like to see in my own politicians a, a higher awareness of the impacts of Catalonia in the rest of the world and uh, how. Uh, the kind of um, consumption and uh, production patterns we have are totally dependent on material inputs from the rest of the world and the inequalities and the impacts this is causing. No? I think this is easily included in uh, political projects uh, and it is not because of uh, let's say power inequalities that should be reversed. No? Well, this is very general, but I think this is what I think. Um, then, on the on the point about the let's say the the praise of normal science, I join this. I mean, I think normal science has been very good for many of us. Uh, but uh, how the benefits of science and technology are distributed, this is how it should be discussed. So, uh, if there is growth and there is more science, who is going to benefit from this growth? Who is, who is going to benefit from this increase of his development, uh, scientific development, and where? So the example that Alberto has mentioned is how technology can be used for the benefit of communities. Then I, I would say, no, 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 we, we have to, to avoid the increase in energy consumption in, in Sarayaco, no, because of the use of technology. But we have to know that with this particular use of technology, we're benefiting a community. And, uh, and, and then no opposition. No? When we see technological progress at the, uh, at the, the, for the benefit of the, or for the increase uh, of uh, private profits, I think this is what you, we should prove. And then we have to be aware how the, 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 the current uh, scientific uh, arrangements and do, are done and how, how, with the kind of uh, funding we are getting, how we are getting, uh, and how this is channeled, uh, for which purposes. And this is, is what I, I would say now. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. I really wish we could stay till three o'clock <laughs> and skip lunch, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, I think the, uh, uh, some of the comments, I think Pawan and Patrick's uh, don't really, uh, I mean, I totally agree. Um, Pawan, I think the only uh, maybe additional point I could make is that um, there have been some attempts of this kind. I know that, that uh, from the Biodiversity Convention uh, meetings, which are in fact bigger, uh, where peoples of the world, uh, indigenous peoples and local communities do manage to come together. There is a facilitation process. They speak their own languages, but there is a facilitation process in which some of us participate to try and uh, ex you know, translate in the best way that we can. But just the fact that the people are together, even if they don't understand each other's languages, there's a lot of non word-based communication and understanding that takes place, you know, eating together, cooking together, etc. So I think we need to create more such uh, possibilities. And also bilateral exchanges. I know, for instance, there was a fascinating exchange between uh, uh, farmers in Peru and farmers in Andhra Pradesh and South India, 
where they didn't speak each other's language at all. There were some facilitators for translation, but much more than that, just being able to see the conditions in which you're living, the fantastic work being done on diversity by both the farming groups, uh, the women's empowerment that is taking place, etc. It was just an uh, incredible coincidence that the word for Earth, Mother Earth, was Panchamma in one and Pachamama in the other. Yeah. And in, in the South Indian context, it's Panchamma. So it was incredible. I mean, they just found out when they started talking to each other. So I think we, we can create spaces of that kind much more. Um, yes, I agree with uh, Beatrice that I think insofar as governments still exist uh, or will continue to exist, we need to influence policy at least in terms of uh, expanding the spaces within the system even as we fight to beat the system or change it. Um, and I think there are two, two uh, uh, crucial ways. One is resistance um, to the current policies. I think the more one resists, the more policymakers have to sit up and say, well, maybe there is something wrong in our policies. But the second is actually to be able to show alternatives, not simply ask for policy changes, but to say, okay, here are the possibilities, and here's how it actually works on the ground. This is happening, for instance, with organic sustainable farming, where uh, in India, which is otherwise um, so dependent on uh, completely destructive, unsustainable farming. There are now 16 states out of 33 which have uh, organic farming policies or programs. Um, you know, various problems with them, but at least you show that you can influence policy. Um, pluralism in India currently is on a serious decline um, because our governments, and especially the, the government right now, is does not tolerate, does not respect. Though in our constitution, if you look at it, for instance, indigenous peoples are supposed to have the space to continue to exist and or develop in the way that they want, right? But in reality, uh, the discourse is still about how do you bring them into the mainstream? Nobody now says how do you civilize them because it's politically inappropriate, but it's still about bringing them into the mainstream. And that's going to happen much more now with this government because it's got a very unilinear way of looking at cultures, at, at uh, economies, and so on. Uh, so there is a counter movement, of course, which is the, the one uh, of civil society and, move, and people's movements, which is arguing that pluralism and diversity has to remain one of the core uh, uh, bases of uh, Indian civilization and India and so far as it remains a country. So it's a counter struggle. It's not very much within the uh, dominant discourse, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Kumar, I think uh, schools and colleges, I think it, it's very important to look at uh, uh, the initiatives that are taking place in India and I guess in lots of other places uh, at alternative education and alternative learning, where the, where the community gets back into the process of learning, where, where children are learning not just from PhD, teachers, but from their own elders, their parents, etc. There are quite a few such initiatives, still very marginal, of course, compared to the mainstream, but there are quite a few such initiatives in India. There's one, for instance, called the Adivasi Academy, which is a sort of indigenous uh, academy which does uh, normal university teaching, but it also has indigenous studies. It actually tries to um, help students to continue being with their indigenous roots uh, and so on. So there are a few like that, and I think we have to figure out how we can uh, understand them, expand them, uh, sorry, not expand them, but document them and make them more known, and then use those to uh, attack the dominant educational system, which is exactly what you said. It completely alienates us. Um, can we abandon modern science? I think the idea is not about abandoning any form of knowledge, but it's about how do you democratize knowledge? How do you democratize the formation of the generation of the transmission of the use of knowledge, whether it is traditional knowledge systems or it's modern science and technology or whatever? And I think, uh, I mean, there are probably not too many attempts at that, but a little bit of what I know about Cuba and what they've attempted to do there, or some of what's happening in some parts of South America now, is that the we have, we have given over the generation of knowledge far too much to these so-called expert institutions. And the same is in India. How do you take control back over the generation of knowledge, all kinds of knowledge, into the hands of people? Uh, there's a fantastic example in South India, again, where women's 
cooperatives have actually taken over control of the agriculture science and technology center which otherwise is controlled by the government all across India. But this one is actually run by women farmers uh, in, and small scale women farmers. And you therefore then begin to see a reversal of the paradigm of, of the development of science and technology coming back into the hands of people. And I think if that happens, there's no reason to say we have to abandon any form of knowledge, but it's about how it's generated and, and, dis and disseminated and kept and used and who controls it. Um, finally, I think Hans' question on, uh, mo on mobilizing middle class, what is the value? It's a tough one. <laughs> it's a very tough one. Um, it, it, I, I don't think we've been very successful in India, uh, but I think the two things. One, the possibilities of being able to communicate much more clearly the kind of common disastrous future we are going towards, whether it is poor people or it's middle classes. Um, we need to do much more of that. And I think climate change has given us a great opportunity for that, uh, a bit of a silver lining in the cloud there. Um, but second, and even more important, to show that we are not just against something, because that's where the middle classes get scared and run away, but that we are for something which is equally prosperous but in a different way, uh, which is equally about creating the uh, you know, convenient ways of meeting needs, but without destroying the earth. And therefore, to be able to actually show that you can, I mean, for instance, organic food is a great example, where middle classes are increasingly actually saying, yes, we would want to go for, for organic food, and we would want to support farmers who are doing organic farming, but where are the systems, the institutional mechanisms, the processes in place to actually let us to do that. Right now, the dominant system simply creates the barriers. So I think if we're able to actually create both this, the, the common disaster, the common uh, future of doom that we're heading towards, and we should be really dramatic there, and the possibilities of real life solutions which are already on the ground, which can also benefit the middle classes and not just the poor, um, then we create more of a possibility of alliance amongst the different uh, classes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. La cuestión de los idiomas es fundamental. Me parece muy importante. La cuestión de los lenguajes es, por supuesto, muy crítica, muy esencial. ¿Cómo podemos incluir eso en nuestros debates y discusiones? Let me give you an example. I was actually, um, I had the possibility to to attend a public hearing of the German Bundestag that was in, in March, and they held a discussion about foreign debt. And three of the people that spoke supported the traditional logic, and three questioned this logic. An Austrian uh, fellow, uh, a Turkish comrade and and me and there was also a British comrade and we uh, wanted to have translation um, I decided to speak in German and uh, I did manage quite well but uh, in the debate it, it got more difficult uh, things got a bit sticky and in such public hearings, for example, you have to have the possibility to uh, to get uh, interpretation for your own mother tongue. I have the privilege to speak in Spanish here, and um, I make use of that uh, privilege. And and but I would say that we should 
have interpretation for all the languages, and we also have to look at the logics of communication. Here, I am speaking to you and you are listening to me in that uh, kind of setup that we're in right now. But there are cultural differences in how communication is organized. In other parts of the world, people are more at eye level to facilitate an exchange. And it is necessary to respect all these different ways of communicating and logics of communication in order to really be able to learn from each other. With respect to universities and schools and education, and from my own personal example, I can say that my children, when they grew up, uh, they went to school, later they went to university, and I was very happy about their performance. And I always encouraged them to strive for the best outcome in their academic work. Now, my grandchildren go to school, and I'm afraid that they will not be able to evolve, to become citizens, that they will not have the opportunity uh, and are granted the privilege to evolve their, evolve their capacity. And let me just quote Ivan Illich again, who said, and I'm quoting to the effect of, that you shouldn't want to send your kids to school because the school now only serves to generate to create a functional labor force that will serve the interests of the market. Now let me speak to development. It is not the pathways to development that are problematic today, but the concept of development itself. When we decided to take it upon us to, uh, to seek development after Truman's speech in 1940, we embarked upon this path of development, and we were seeking that phantom that doesn't really exist. And we tried to become as the U.S. or Europe. And the left said we should uh, strive to be more like Vietnam or the USSR. And we encountered some problems, of course, and then later we tried to change the concept because we found out that it's quite difficult to realize, so uh, we had just development, we had indigenous development, we had uh, green development now, we ha have green development now, now we, have su we had sustainable development, but it's still the same logic of development, and it implies, it entails a globalized lifestyle. But we have to go beyond this universalization of the notion of development. The industrialized nations cannot be a role model for us because they are not developed well in terms of quality. Their development is a false development. They have to contract. Why should we have a development uh, that is dominated by your notion of development? Why should we develop like you develop? Why do we have to use uh, solar panels that are produced in the north. We should produce our own technology. We should use our own our own means to produce such a technology. In Berlin, I see many houses that are equipped with solar panels. In a country where you can see the sun only on postcards, but not actually shining in the sky. But in my country, the sun is shining every day and we haven't come up with our own technology yet. So this is a challenge that we are facing. We should not abandon technology, we should just generate different technology. Now with respect to plurinationality, let me say a few words, or I would like to say a few words, maybe we can do that later in a different setting. But I do want to say a few words about Yasuni. Yasuni remains a fantastic idea. Resistance was built from below, from civil society, resistance against Texaco, Chevron Texaco. That is a project that uh, was born in civil society. With Joan, we wrote the book uh, Ecuador on Ecuador after oil. 
and we looked at uh, how we could delay the exploration and exploitation of of oil in order to make it less destructive and less degrading to the environment and since 2012 forces in civil society worked on I on issues how to connect this question and how to uh, actually make it an issue of the of the entire world so the deal was that uh, ecuador would stop stop paying its foreign debt and uh, and uh, would start exporting oil now and then later subsequently we had a debate and oil watch started to develop solutions the industrialized world that is responsible for most of the destruction, we demanded that they provide a compensation for not having to exploit the oil that is below the ground in the, Nasa, in, in the Yasuni National Park. In order to protect the indigenous people that live indigenous peoples that live on those territories in order to protect, to preserve the biodiversity in this region. In order to preserve the uh, carbon sinks, maybe we would wanted to protect the water. But first and foremost, we wanted to foster a different relationship between the poor and the rich, the rich that are responsible for this crisis and those that suffer the consequences of these of these crises but what happened later was a blackmailing we wanted to blackmail them we wanted to say if you don't pay if the international community doesn't pay then you are responsible will be responsible for, for the consequences but we are all responsible for pachamama for mother earth but there are those who bear a greater responsibility because they cause greater destruction to Mother Earth than the others, and that is the rich North. And this is what we have to take into perspective in order to bring about more justice, global justice and environmental justice. There was a moment where we all agreed, we came to an agreement on this issue, and we received many support from Germany. In 2008, we received letters from all the parliamentarians in Germany who voiced their support for our plan, and that they wanted to support our plan to make it successful but later with Mr. Niebel as you know he sabotaged this entire Yasuni project he was worried about the fact that uh, or he was worried he was afraid that these projects would actually proliferate and uh, there would be more of Yasuni uh, projects. But we actually need thousands and thousands of these Yasuni projects in order to save the world, to save the planet. But we also had our own responsibilities. Our president was not also not up to the task. We have to create more Yasunis. We have to replicate and to proliferate uh, more Yasunis. We need a charter for the rights of nature, not only for the charter, a charter for human rights. We have to be able to guarantee and to secure the reproduction of life and not only the reproduction of capital. Thank you. So we are in five minutes.
done, or maybe in three. And before um, um, we will have some announcements, then I, it's not a conclusion, but what I take um, with me from this um, uh, discussion. But before, since we talked about language and language and understanding is important, I ask you to give a great applause to the translators. So there are some publications from Ijol, from the Ijol project, Beatrice brought with her, and Ashish would like to yeah, announce a book uh, launch this tonight. Uh, yeah, well, uh, 2.30 uh, we have a session actually on radical ecological democracy and Boy and Vive are looking at the sort of commonalities. That's an HS11. And there's also, unfortunately, clashing, I think, with the book launch you announced at 8 o'clock. Uh, a book launch on, uh, it's called Churning the Earth. It's a book on globalization and alternatives in, in India. So you're most welcome. That's an HSHS4. Uh, I do have a few brochures on some of the issues that I spoke about, which I'll put here. And in the spirit of uh, uh, local trading, uh, local, what? local currencies, uh, you can take it free, but it would be nice if there's a contribution that goes back to some of our work in India if you're picking up the brochure. Thank you. So in fact, there's no competition because a book launch, um, it's, it's at 7, um, Ashish is no, at no, 8, no. Um, a book presentation, uh, a, a book which is called Beyond Development, which comes out of a working group, um, Beyond Development, um, Alberto and I and others here in the room collaborate uh, with, at 7 o'clock in the um, um, sala on the um, um, auditorium 6, and there's also, um, um, we distribute the book for free. It's a translation of our work in Spanish into English with the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. Please, please feel free. And since we talk about alternatives, this is unfortunately only for the, those who um, read the German, we published a book um, on an ABC of alternatives because we are sometimes accused, where are your alternatives? You are only criticizing. There's also a contribution by uh, Alberto, some other colleagues from Latin America. It's something about um, environmental justice and others. Stefan, who is co-editor of the book, um, um, sells the book for you only five euros. So if you like, it's uh, many, many, Patrick Bond also has an entry, and there, um, there, there are many books, uh, there are many uh, concepts which um, announce, um, uh, or which condense a bit our debates of alternatives. So, just two um, minutes, or even only one. What I take with me, um, beside many, many ideas um, which were developed um, and debated today, is that a perspective from the Global South might give us the task in the degrowth debate to make the degrowth proposal maybe a bit more anti-capitalist, a bit more explicitly um, anti-capitalist. The degrowth perspective might allow us to look on our concrete situations, constellations in Europe, but we should, of course, allow and develop and take up other terms from other contexts and not to have a kind of a traveling concept around the world, which I learned today. But, and this I found really brilliant in uh, um, Bea's introduction, to look for analogies, to look for commonalities of struggles uh, throughout the world without denying the context. The concepts are contested as Alberto told us that the Buen Vivir is now tried to be linked to the green economy debate, and we know that how sustainable development and others are today mainstreamed in the, in the uh, bad sense. I won't see actually currently the danger that the degrowth concept is captured, but we should be aware of it. So what could be shifting discourses that also other official institutions take it? And the last thought is that um, Ashish insisted uh, that the way of communicating, the way to, to bring our thoughts together, the how question is quite important. And of course, we're here at a conference, and we have always this time restriction. However, I, thought, I found these two hours very, very convenient. And I would like to thank you three and uh, all of you. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you very much for having been here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a copy of the Do you have a copy of the Yeah, yeah. Oh, two copies, but yeah, they're supposed to.